And today, a real living legend in the annals of Louisiana government and Louisiana politics, the Honorable William J. Bill Dodd, who was Lieutenant Governor under Earl Long, who was Superintendent of Education twice and was State Representative twice, who was a judge in the United States Army War Crimes Trials. He's done it just about all, and uh, Bill, welcome to Louisiana Legend. It's good to be here with you, Gus. Bill, you were born in Liberty, Texas, and then when you were a very little baby, your folks moved over into Louisiana to a logging camp near Elizabeth. Your dad must have what, followed the timber business, huh? Yes, he worked for the Industrial Lumber Company in Elizabeth. I want to get to a fascinating part of your career, and it's one that I don't think a lot of folks know about. You attended Louisiana Normal College, which is now Northwestern University. Uh, you were a championship intercollegiate debater. You played baseball. In fact, you pitched and beat LSU 10 to 2, which I think you still take some of the gratification from. But something else happened to you at Louisiana Normal that I think was probably the beginning of Bill Dodd's career. Would you tell us about it? Well, in 1932, I came back to Normal. I had quit the college for a while to go out and play professional baseball and get a little money to come back to school and I was a, a professional. In those days a baseball player couldn't play intercollegiate uh, football or baseball if he had played pro baseball. So I looked for something else to do and I joined a debating club and I got on the staff of the college paper and I was doing some reporting for the Shreveport Journal. The kids at Normal, led by our own J.A. Rockhold here in Baton Rouge, had a strike up there. And I reported the strike, and I reported it as it happened to the Shreveport Journal, and the president didn't like the way I reported it, and he expelled me. And that meant I, my education was over with. I was expelled, so I talked Cap Barham, who later became lieutenant governor, who was then a lawyer in Ruston to represent me. I told him he'd get a lot of publicity out of it because <laughs> the president was Huey Long's first cousin. And the press was against Huey. And I said, you'll be on the front page every day if you'll represent me. Uh, I didn't say for nothing, but he knew he wasn't <laughs> going to get anything because I didn't have anything. He represented me, and we tied up the faculty and the town of Natchitoches for about a week in a trial, and the judge held in my favor and made the president take me back. And as a result of that, I became a kind of a campus hero. And all through my life, college kids who've been in trouble would come to me and they'd say, Mr. Dodd, or Governor Dodd, or Superintendent Dodd, or something Dodd, we know what kind of a student you were in college, and you'll help us because you helped yourself and you helped the other kids. I stood up for free speech and the First Amendment, and and probably the only student in Louisiana that graduated with a mandamus <laughs> in his pocket. In fact, I took all my exams uh, on carbon paper and kept them at the request of my attorneys because we were afraid the president was going to flunk me out since he couldn't throw me out. Now, it's interesting that your lawyer, he was then a young lawyer, Cap Barham, followed you as lieutenant governor of Louisiana some years later. Isn't that correct? That's right. He and his partner... Uh, a boy named Truett Scarborough uh, represented me, but Cap did most of the trial work and uh, did a did a real really good job. Bill, you uh, became a coach and a teacher at Oakdale High. You were coaching football and I think teaching debate. Now there was a very bright young lady in one of your classes. Her name was Verone Ford, and uh, she was a, a, a very attractive and obviously very bright young lady. Well, four years later, you ran again into this former uh, student of yours, and, and, and something happened. <laughs> well, Verone's name was Verone Forward, and she was a bright young lady, and I was teaching history, and she and three other girls uh, talked so much that I put them in the four corners of the room so they couldn't, <laughs> couldn't talk, and uh, she was valedictorian of that senior class that first mm -hmm. year I taught. And I didn't pay much attention to her. She was bright and she was cute. But uh, I hunted and fished with her father. And she'd come back from normal. She went to normal too and became a teacher. Or graduated in education and was going to become a teacher. 
And I saw her all dressed up one evening. I'd come back from fishing with her daddy. And she looked so pretty, I decided to ask her for a date the next night. And she wouldn't give me a date. So I said, well, I'll be down here at 7 o'clock. Your date's at 7.30. And I was down there at 7 o'clock, and <laughs> that started it. And uh, How long we, later we, we got, got married? We got married. Uh, that was way back in, she won't appreciate this, but uh, way back in 1939. A lot of people said that I married her so I could get elected representative <laughs> because her daddy was the mayor. <laughs> it was a very popular politician. That's so funny. She's a delightful, lovely lady, and, and, and you did real well. Uh, you went, World War II began, and you went uh, into the service. You were an officer in chemical warfare at first, and then in military government. In Germany, uh, uh, I think that was one of the very fascinating, again, most folks don't know this, one of the fascinating parts of your career. You presided over some war crimes trials, did you not? Well, I was attached to the 8th Air Force while I was in England for about a year, and I got General Eisenhower I signed a one-page, one-person change order for me to get out of the 8th Air Force and join the 3rd Armored Division. So I went into Germany with the 3rd Armored Division. We broke the secret line along with Big One and a Canadian division. And Germany didn't surrender this time when we got on German soil. They hadn't read the press reports in the United States, so they didn't <laughs> surrender. Somebody had to look after the civilians. They were getting in the way of the army. So they looked at my file and saw that I'd been a politician. So I started out small and got to be the military governor of Aachen. And I was a court-martial myself, a one-man court-martial. But I sat on the first war criminal trial of a fellow named Otto Mai, who had built airfields for the for the German army, and who had decided that the war was going to go against Germany, and he was buying up rock quarries and everything else. He had been a member of the Brown Shirts, which was a forerunner of the SS. And in that trial, it came out how the Brown Shirts had stomped people's eyes out, and it was a, it was a terrible crime. We gave the man 10 years. That was all that we could give him but we bucked it up to a general court-martial, and I don't know what ever happened to uh, Otto Meyer, but he was a bad actor. Today he's probably a multimillionaire living in Germany and, and uh, uh, probably, probably in the is. electronics business in Germany. Another thing, uh, I registered a little slender German uh, one time who was talked perfect English named Krupp, and I asked him, was he, had any, did he have anything to do with the Krupp Steelworks? He yes. said, yes. I am the Krupp Steel. That, that'd be like asking Henry Ford if he had anything to do with Ford. More. In fact, uh, I found out through him that the Krupp Steelworks made guns and typewriters and all kinds of things other than big uh, munitions, big guns. And he took me to a place where we had taken guns away from the civilians and showed me a Krupp shotgun which I appropriated to my own use and sent home. <laughs> I still have it. Is that right? Beautiful little 20-gauge hammerless double barrel shotgun. Bill, prior to going in the service, uh, you had run for state representative. Uh, yeah. Your very first campaign, was it not? That's right. That you ran for office. Yeah. What made you decide to enter public life? I mean, you had the natural attributes, your speech ability and so on. I always liked politics. I liked it in high school, and I was kind of the campus politician at normal. But did any and, one turn you on? Did yes. any one politician influence you? Uh, <clears throat> well, I was influenced some by Huey Long. I used to listen to Huey when, when I was a kid in, in elementary school. I was in college when, uh, I say elementary school, the lower part of high school, I guess, at Zawali. And I was in college in 1928 when Huey was elected governor. Now, I didn't like Huey particularly, uh, admire him, because my mother uh, opposed him, said he was a demigod. But my dad voted for him and was one of his workers because he said he got the job done. And he did get the job done. I liked to hear him talk. He could, he could get things down so even a, a kid in eighth grade could understand what he was talking about. And he was one of the greatest uh, speakers. I've ever heard. Uh, 
when you were overseas in the military, uh, you were reelected to the House of Representatives by your constituency back in Allen Parish. That's right. Then after the service, you went to LSU, did you not got your law degree? I came back, when I came back, the school board in Allen Parish had decided to make me superintendent of parish schools. And my wife's folks, she was, her mother was a hanchy, and a lot of the hanchies in this state are school people. Several of them were parish superintendents. And my wife and I differed on what I should do. She wanted me to take the job as superintendent. And I told her I was going to law school and get into politics, big politics. And I went to law school. And uh, Sammy Downs, Senator Downs, Downs yes. Judge Overton, we were all in the legislature and all in law school at the same time. And uh, I enjoyed my law school days. I told the kids in law school I'd give myself my own diploma. <laughs> and I did because I was acting governor at the time I graduated from law school and did give myself my LSU diploma <laughs> and gave them theirs. How did you come to the attention of Earl Long? How did, uh, how did that, how'd y'all, how'd y'all get together? Well, before? you've got to know Louisiana politics. Earl Long lost the governor's race in 1940 because he got crossed up with a teacher. Then Earl was always sensitive to the fact that he was a draft dodger, so-called, allegedly a draft dodger in World War I. So he had the veterans against him, and he had the teachers against him. I had been president of the Louisiana Teachers Association and helped pass the Tenure Act and helped pass the amendment, putting the severance tax in the public education fund, and was very popular with the teachers. And I was going to, by being on his ticket, I helped get the veterans satisfied and the School people. School people. In fact, when I came back from the war, Jimmy Davis had given, he was governor, he gave my education committee chairmanship to a fellow named Ivy Hare. And I went up to see him and told him I was going to raise some cane if I didn't get it back. And Jimmy, being a good compromiser, he said, we don't have a committee on veterans affairs. So they formed a committee on veterans affairs that, and gave it to me. Is that right? That's right. And I introduced then all of your veterans legislation. Jimmy Davis was a great friend of the veterans after World War II. Uh, Bill, uh, so you uh, ran with Earl Long as his That's lieutenant right. governor. Who, who opposed y'all? Who was y'all's principal opponents in that race? This was what, 19 what? Uh, 1947 and 8. Yes, sir. Uh, governor Sam Jones had tried to make a comeback. Now, Sam Jones was a reform governor who had defeated Earl in 1940 after the scandal. Yes, sir. Earl had a rematch with him in 1948, and Governor, Lieutenant Governor Verrett ran for Lieutenant Governor on Sam Jones's ticket. Emil Verrett from Emile Liberia. Yeah. Very fine man and a very good friend of mine because he'd been a schoolman. He was president of the State School Board Association. We'd been very friendly and stayed friendly all during the campaign. J.Y. Fontenot, who was a DA in Same Opelousas, Landry. yes ran for lieutenant governor on Jimmy Morrison's ticket. Morrison was in that race also. And we were friendly. But uh, I didn't have any trouble. I got all of Earl's friends and brought with me to Earl a lot of veterans and a lot of school people. Now, when y'all were uh, elected, uh, uh, you, uh, you and, and, and Governor Long, y'all were so close, you were going to open a law practice in Lake Charles, and he said, no, no, please live in Baton Rouge where you can be more help to me. So it started out as just an ideal combination. But something happened which Jim McLean, the late Jim McLean of the Associated Press, said became the feud of the decade. What happened? <laughs> well, it really wasn't a feud. It, Earl Long and I were sort of like professional baseball players. Uh, we would fight hard against each other in the game, and after the game was over, we'd make up. Uh, Earl, I didn't understand Earl's strategy in politics until it took me 30 years to understand him. Earl had no ambition other than the ambition to be governor every other four years. When he was out, he didn't want one of his protégés or a long man in the governor's office. He wanted somebody he could cuss and harass and make the people Run mad at. Four years, yeah. And he would come back. 
And Earl, by having that strategy and following those tactics, was able to pass a lot of legislation during his four years that wasn't popular at the time he passed it, but was sound and would become popular and known to be sound during the administration of his successor. So he would walk back in after Kennan was elected in 52, who defeated me and Judge Spate here in Baton Rouge and Hale Boggs. Earl waltzed back in in 56, but Earl waltzed back in with me, again with him in 56. So y'all would get mad and glad and make up and break up? When Earl, had, I went to the mansion, when Earl had promised to run me for governor. That was one of the things that got me on the ticket in 52. And when I went over there to get him to keep his promise, he said, I couldn't be elected. I said, I know I can't be elected unless you're for me. He said, I'm going to beat you if you persist. He wanted me to run for lieutenant governor again with Judge Digby, yes. his rental board chairman. So he says, I'm going to beat you. I'm going to lie on you. I'm going to tear you up. <laughs> I said, well, Governor, I learned my politics under the smartest politician in Louisiana, and I'm going to tear your candidate up. <laughs> he swelled up and he said, uh, who's the best, who you think's the best politician in Louisiana? I said, you. <laughs> and he kind of grinned, and we left friendly. Well, he did tear me up. I didn't have a square inch of skin left on me when the campaign was over. But neither did Judge Spade nor Hale Boggs. I helped, I defeated them, but Earl defeated me and helped defeat his own candidate. His he didn't want Judge Spade for governor. He didn't want Hale Boggs, whom Russell, Russell Long came down here and supported Hale Boggs, who was Shep Morris's friend at that time, and who had opposed Russell for the U.S. Senate. I always thought Russell should have supported Spate first because he owed or along his Senate election. But if he hadn't supported Spade, I thought he should have supported me. In 56, you were elected state auditor. And then, I think you were then uh, ahead, perhaps the most interesting job because of the, the time of any uh, uh, of the positions you ha you've held in your distinguished career. You were chairman of the State Board of Education. It was 1960, but friends, this was the 1960 in Louisiana when all hell broke loose on the school desegregation uh, 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 crisis. Uh, uh, you were, in your position as, as chairman, you were brutally attacked, were you not, by the segregationists? Well, we were, the board was attacked by the hardliners on both sides. The, some of the whites uh, were against any kind of uh, program that would let the blacks into the schools, and some of the blacks wanted a lot more than, than they were justified in getting at the time, and it was hard to be a moderate. It was better to be on one side or the other. I got uh, the State Board of Education to let me handle the first real trouble we had. A fellow over at Lake Charles had devised a test that an MIT graduate couldn't pass to let people get into his trade school. He did it to keep blacks from keep blacks getting off. in. And I told Judge West that we would make him and the other trade school directors give a fair test and let anybody who was qualified get in. And he lifted the contempt order against us. That's when Shelby Jackson said I was a traitor and then John Garrett, uh, who was Speaker of the House, jumped on me. And, and, and Judge Perez must have flipped out over that. But huh? Judge Perez, uh, didn't pay too much attention to, to it at the time. Uh, he, was, he wasn't as much a, a, a segregationist at that time as he was a little bit later on. Later on. Uh, it, was, it was peculiar when I was getting back to the state auditor. When I got into the state auditor's job, I found out he didn't have any duties. It was, uh, <laughs> I told the press one day, they asked me what I thought about the job. I said, well, I'm going to ask the legislature to abolish it. Because the only duty I had as state auditor was to sign checks. And I had a machine to do that. <laughs> so there wasn't a single duty. And, and the, finally, the legislature did abolish the job. There was no challenge in that job. How did you enjoy? You were elected superintendent of uh, education and then reelected. 
How did you enjoy that job, Superintendent of Education? Well, I, I enjoyed it because it was the most nearly perfect campaign I ever took part in. I had Shep Morrison supporting me. I had the Long Faction supporting me. I had the Picayune and the Advocate and the Shreveport Times. I had all the power in Louisiana supporting me. Nice feeling. And the only people who opposed me were some of the establishment in the education department because they wanted a professional educator. Of course, I'd been president of the LTA. Teacher. And I'd been a teacher. Coach. But deep down, the challenge to me was to keep us from having the same kind of trouble they had in Little Rock, keep the schools open and keep the races at least communicating with each other and no school stoppages and not getting any school children hurt. We integrated the schools and colleges and trade schools of Louisiana without one day of stoppage, without one child getting hurt, without any trouble from the blacks or the whites. The only state in the union that that happens here. You know, that's a very interesting uh, uh, point that you brought out there. I think that uh, the rest of the world has a tendency to group all southern states together. And uh, uh, there was not that much bloodshed, was there, for example, at the height of the uh, 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 integration crisis in Louisiana? And the schools did not close, did they? No, we had no trouble. For instance, the only college, the last college to integrate in Louisiana was Grambling, an all-black college. Nobody wanted to give uh, President Jones any trouble. So he couldn't get anybody to file a lawsuit against him. Finally, a nun, a white nun in Lafayette, applied for entrance, and he turned her down because it was chartered. That was another thing. My strategy was to get the school people to obey state law until a local federal judge struck it down, based on the premise that people will obey a local federal judge when they will not obey a United States Supreme Court order like the Brown case. And it worked to perfection. Every school district was chartered by law as a white and black dual system. Everyone had a court order to be integrated, a local federal judge. Every college was desegregated. Nichols College was desegregated by Judge Ainsworth with a court order. All a judge, all a lawyer had to do is go in and ask that a black student get in and the president of the college wouldn't let him because the state law wouldn't let him. And then the federal judge would strike the state law down and in he'd go and it was all over with. If a young fella came to you today, or a young lady, and said, uh, Mr. Bill, we're thinking about uh, going into politics, would you tell them to stay clear of it? Would you tell them to proceed? What, what, what counsel would you give them about this? Because you and I know it's a very rough existence, this political existence. Well, uh, Jimmy Davis uh, has said several times that people stay out of politics because they, they don't want to subject their families to the scrutiny that the press gives them and the public. Uh, a politician's family suffers more than he does. Then the, uh, you can't make any money in politics. Uh, if you make it legitimately, you'll be accused of stealing. If you make it illegitimately, you're going to go to the jail. Earl Long was scrupulously honest in his administration, and he made all of his subordinates and all of his appointees stay honest. Uh, and he influenced me a great deal. For instance, for years, I was able to buy my wife a Cadillac or a big car. And I wouldn't buy a big car <laughs> because Earl said that people would think I was stealing of course, big car. if I was riding around in a Cadillac. And so my wife suffered in that she couldn't get the big car that she liked to drive. Yes, sir. Which she wants. Well, she drives one today. Right. Uh, Earl, Earl influenced me a great deal, in fact, uh, more than any other politician, and he felt that way. Earl was maligned, Jimmy Davis was maligned, Jimmy Davis was as honest as the day's long. In fact, most politicians are honest uh, either because they want to be or because they have to They're be. They're scared. They have to be. Bill, what do you do with yourself now that, that you, I know you're semi-retired at least? Well, I help my son practice law a little bit. He humors me by asking me questions that he probably <laughs> already knows, letting me 
uh, take a deposition for him or do things <laughs> like that. But I spend most of my time hunting and fishing, writing, and uh, visiting and enjoying. If you uh, had to do it all over friends. again, would you go into politics? I'd go into politics again, but I would uh, I would do it do some things a little bit differently. I'd try to study my opponents a little better. And <laughs> I, I certainly wouldn't have run for governor as long as Earl Long was alive. Bill, uh, our time is running down. Uh, you've made some marvelous contributions uh, uh, to this state. Uh, you've been in positions of power and influence when the going was very rough, uh, uh, when it uh, took an awful lot of experience and intelligence and some dignity and mostly some courage uh, uh, to steer uh, a steady course. And I think that you did that. And I think that uh, history is going to be very, very kind uh, to you and, and make your loved ones awfully proud. So I want to thank you for joining us today on Louisiana Legends because uh, you certainly deserve to be here. Thank you. Thank Russ. you, Bill. Thank you.